along the way has a lot of interesting things to say about David Greenglass and the Rosenbergs. And then we have Brad Snyder who filed a, a noted legal scholar who wrote the key law review article about the Supreme Court's failures in reviewing the Rosenberg case. Um, and Brad did one of the key declarations in this lawsuit on our behalf. We're really fortunate to have him with us. And then we have our ace lawyer, uh, David Vladek, who's been really the guiding legal genius behind this entire strategy of getting his opened historically valuable grand jury records. And David won this case in 2008, uh, got the Julius and Ethel Rosenberg grand jury materials released. There was an exception carved out for David Greenglass. He was still alive. He objected. Uh, the judge refused to include his material. But since he passed away last year, David Greenglass, David Vladek reopened the case on our behalf. And I should just say a final word of thanks to the incredible lineup of the plaintiffs, or I guess technically petitioners in this case, because it includes the American Historical Association, the American Society of Legal History, the Organization of American Historians, Society of American Archivists, and journalist Sam Roberts, who works in the New York Times, but is famous for his book on green glass, because he was the first one to get David Greenglass to admit that he had lied on the witness stand to protect his wife, but it ended up convicting his sister. Um, so let's just start off, I'm going to ask Steve Usden to go first about the historical significance of this document. And I would just say for all of those of you who would like a, your own copies, we have hard copies here at this briefing. We've also posted it on the National Security Archive website, which you can get to at nsarchive.org. Uh, thanks to George Washington University, which uh, hosts this site. Uh, that posting has links to the previous petitions and briefs in this matter, most of them written or co-written by David Black. It has links to the declarations by historians and scholars like Steve Usden as long ago as 2008, saying why this is so historically valuable and worth doing. Um, and it has all the rulings, including Judge Hellerstein's historic ruling in May, basically slapping down the government and saying, no, green glass has passed away. There's no right of privacy. This is historically valuable. We're going to order its release. So the government informed us this week that they would not appeal that ruling. Uh, we received this document this morning. It's on the web. I recommend it for your reading. But let me turn it over to Steve Usden to give us a quick briefing on the historical value of this and what's new. Well, thank, thanks, thanks, Tom. And I, and I want to thank you for organizing this and for all the energy that, that, that the archives have put into this. And also, especially, uh, thank David Vladek for fantastic um, work in getting this done, in getting this released, and 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 even in the face of the government um, trying to deny and trying to prevent um, the second release, the release of the, the green glass material, which kind of floored me that they would try to do that, but fortunately they didn't appeal and, and, and we've got it. So, so to me, there's, this is, this is it, folks. This is the last important documentary evidence that we're going to have about the Rosenberg case, unless the Russians decide to open up their archives, which um, seems extraordinarily unlikely. Um, so I think this, this is it. Um, and, and to me, at this point, there's really three questions about the Rosenberg case that matter. The first is, um, were they guilty? And if they were, what were they guilty of? The second is, was the trial fair? Were they fairly convicted? And the third was, did they deserve the, the death penalty? And um, I'll start with the third one. My personal feeling is that obviously they, they, they clearly they did not deserve the death penalty. And that was a, we, we all wouldn't be here today if they hadn't been executed. I think it's fair to say that the, the, the tremendous interest in the case wouldn't have happened. And, and that was a, a terrible miscarriage of justice. As to the first, the first, um, and as to the first question, the the materials were released today. Um, David Greenglass's testimony and also um, Alector's um, testimony shed some light on the question about um, guilt. Um, it, it's been a long time. It's been clear for a very long time that Julius Rosenberg was guilty, and it's been clear what he was guilty of. But this kind of um, confirms some of the things we've known and gives us a little bit of new information. Um, the uh, the thing that, that, that I think is most important about the Rosenberg case to know about, because the attention has been on about the atomic espionage, is that their espionage, their industrial espionage, their military um, espionage, was far more important and um, widespread. They um, stole um, and gave to the Soviet Union the proximity fuse. They gave them um, 
blueprints and specifications for virtually every radar that the United States developed um, during and uh, in the years after the um, Second World War, and um, specifications for um, um, early uh, jet aircraft and jet engines, just to name um, a little bit of what they did. Uh, the, this, the second question, though, about guilty is, is who was guilty and guilty of what? Um, and, the, of course, the main question about that centers around Ethel. And I think that what the grand jury records that were released to, um, today show is that Ethel was clearly aware of what Julius Rosenberg was doing and what David Rosenberg, uh, uh, David Greenglass was, was doing. She supported that work. She helped to recruit um, Ruth Greenglass as a spy, and she helped to get Ruth to persuade um, David um, to spy for the Soviet Union. And we know from other sources that she had met with at least two Soviet case officers. There was one incident that um, we know where she acted as, a, as an inter intermediary for communications with a um, Soviet case officer. But that's about it. Um, and interestingly enough, um, uh, the uh, Soviet intelligence never assigned her uh, a cover name. They never treated her as, as an agent. On the other hand, um, what this information does show is that Ruth was, was far more involved um, with Soviet espionage than Ethel was, that um, she um, acted as a courier, that she um, uh, was considered, she had a cover name from, um, from Soviet intelligence and that she was considered to be um, an, an active um, operative. Uh, on the question about whether the trial was fair, I'll, I'll leave that to Brad and, and David to talk about more, but I think that the grand jury records support, though they don't prove, that um, David Greenglass perjured himself during the trial uh, by making up stories about Ethel's involvement, in particular saying that she had typed notes that, um, uh, typed his notes uh, about espionage and um, subsequently giving them to, to um, Julius to give to the Russians. Um, I think that it's, so it's clear that Ethel um, was playing a supporting role in espionage. I, I think it's also clear that the, that the government didn't have, uh, on the basis of, of the testimony that they had from David Greenglass and from other members of the ring, they didn't have sufficient evidence to, to convict her. I think that the, the big unanswered question that we still have is, um, how was it that, uh, what are the mechanics that were involved in David Greenglass apparently making up the story about um, uh, Apple typing the notes. Did that come from the government? Did it come from him and Ruth? Um, I don't think that we know, and I don't think maybe we will ever know. Um, but I think that's one of the important unknowns. Um, some other observations um, based on the, 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 this testimony. One is um, the, the naivety and, and I would say um, foolishness of um, um, David Greenglass. It, it's really clear, we know from other, from the Vasiliev notebooks and from the Venona documents, that David Greenglass and um, Julius Rosenberg knew that um, David was going to be arrested. They knew in advance. They knew that he was going to be presented with evidence that he had met um, with Harry Gold. And um, Julius had told him to just keep quiet, and he had agreed to just keep quiet. If, in fact, he did, if he had followed that advice, it seems to me very likely that um, there never would have been a prosecution there, and if there had been a prosecution, it, it's, it's likely it wouldn't have been successful. Um, another thing that, that comes out that's very interesting from these documents, it confirms um, information that we've had from other um, sources, including Ruth um, Greenglass's testimony, that Julius Rosenberg had extensive and deep knowledge of the atom bomb um, during the war, and that he used that information to brief David Greenglass who didn't even know when he was um, when he was uh, first uh, when he'd been working for some time at Los Alamos. He didn't even know he was working on the atom bomb. And um, uh, Julius Rosenberg's really fascinating um, comments in the, in the documents here, where uh, Julius Rosenberg told Ruth that Ruth told David that and David um, uh, expresses uh, and he told Ruth, "Oh yeah, of course I knew." But then he says to the grand jury, "But I didn't really. <laughs> he didn't really know that that's what he'd been." what he was working on. And the fact that the information that Julius gave him allowed him to know what 
what to look for and what information to give to the Soviets. A couple of final points. To me, one of the other things that's astounding about the, the, the Rosenberg case is the fact that they um, continued to spy after the war. And um, that's where Elector's testimony comes in. He talks of, uh, extensively in there about espionage that happened after the Second World War. And if you think about it, um, it's one thing to spy um, for the Soviet Union, which was an ally of the United States during the war. It's a completely different thing to spy for them after the war. And it tells you something about the motivations of the Rosenberg Ring. I think it tells you that they were motivated entirely by their dedication to communism. And that um, they didn't miss a beat. In, in all of the tens of thousands of pages of documents that have come out about the case, there is never, in, there isn't anywhere that I've seen a hint that any member of the Rosenberg Ring was thought twice about spying for the Soviet Union after the Second World War was over, at a time when all of them believed that armed conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union was a probability. Um, I think the other thing, maybe I'll, I'll stop because I've gone on too long, is, is uh, from the elector um, testimony. It, there's nothing in there that's, um, <coughs> that's new to people who have studied the case for a long time, but for people who haven't, I, I would recommend reading it. It's really fascinating because it gives you a sense of um, how Julius Rosenberg operated, how persistent he was, how he went um, time and time again, he went back to Elector and tried to recruit him um, to spy for the Soviet Union, how persistent he was, and also some of the kind of social dynamics around um, the people, the other members of the, uh, the Rosenberg Ring. Thanks, Steve. We'll come back to you at the end. Let's have Brad to talk about the, Brad wrote the really quintessential law review article about the failure of the Supreme Court to review the, the case um, and the implication of what Steve just had to say that this revelation today in effect points to perjury on the stand by David Greenglass against his own sister um, and serious prosecutorial misconduct. Let's have Brad comment on that and uh, what happened. Yeah, thanks Tom for having me and thanks uh, David for um, engaging in this litigation. I mean it's every legal historian's um, dream to have um, lawyers fighting hard um, to open documents up to the public. Um, but I, I, this case is really interesting to me on um, three levels. Um, the first one is a human level, the second one is um, a legal level, and, and a subset of that is just a, a very sad episode in sort of our constitutional history. Um, the human level, I know this is a serious subject, but I'll start out with the famous line from Woody Allen where he says in Crimes and mis Misdemeanors, he says, um, I love him like a brother, David Greenglass, and, and and what he, um, Woody Allen meant by that was, here you have a guy, David Greenglass, who um, basically sent his sister um, to the electric chair on testimony that was probably um, made up um, in order to save himself and, and to save his wife. Um, you know, that would make for any um, television drama, you know, that would be you know, must-see um, viewing for any sort of television uh, drama today. And I, I think what, uh, what these grand jury transcripts show is it increases the probability that David Greenglass was making up um, two critical pieces of evidence. As he, as he told Sam Roberts of the New York Times that he, he did um, make up some, some evidence. And those two pieces of evidence, one, most people focus on, um, so the government, just to do the, on the legal level, let me do the legal level first. Um, the government, the prosecutors have complete control over a grand jury hearing, right? We know this from Ferguson. There's no defense counsel um, present at a, at a um, grand jury hearing. Um, so prosecutors, prosecutors bring in all sorts of hearsay evidence that, that doesn't get objected to at a grand jury hearing. Really, they get to tell the narrative in the way um, that they want and that is most favorable to the government getting an indictment. Right. So in, in this case, what's striking is, is the, what's not in David Greenglass's um, grand jury testimony. Um, because what's not in um, Grant, David Greenglass's grand jury testimony um, is the evidence that was used at trial um, to convict Ethel, his sister. Right? And the first piece of evidence um, that was used at trial um, were, was the fact that um, Ethel typed up notes. Right? That made, that's the overt act that made her part of the conspiracy, that she typed up handwritten notes to give to the Soviets. Well, there's nothing about that in the grand jury testimony. Right. The, the second thing, and I think the thing, the thing is often overlooked by people with the Rosenberg's case, is, is 
is this console table. So at trial, both Ruth and, and David Greenglass testified at trial that the Soviets had given Julius and Ethel Rosenberg a hollowed out console table with a lamp under it so that they could microfilm David's notes. Well, there is nothing about a console table, and, and, and there was nothing about a console table in this grand jury testimony. And, and what makes that significance is, significant is um, that, and this gets to sort of the constitutional historical level, is that this case was never briefed and argued on the merits before the United States Supreme Court. And there was a very strong argument presented to the court, I've argued in my law review article, that the trial was, uh, was unfair because the prosecutors were using knowingly perjured testimony. And that argument was pre presented to Justice Robert Jackson um, on June 12, 1953. And the testimony was, hey, we found the console table in Ethel's mother's apartment, and it wasn't hollowed out. Right? So this credits testimony um, that Julius and Ethel had um, in their defense that we didn't have a hollowed out console table. We had a console table, but it wasn't hollowed out. And this really challenges the credibility of Ruth and David Greenglass. Well, today, the grand jury testimony, the prosecution would have had to turn over because in some ways it exculpates Julius and Ethel. Right? They would have had to turn it over under a Supreme Court case known as Brady, under a statute in the Jenks Act, and probably under Rule 6 of the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure, although I am not a criminal procedure expert. But, but, but so they probably would have had to turn over those grand jury notes, which are usually sealed, or the transcripts, which are usually sealed, because in some ways they exculpate the defendants, or at least support the defendant's version of events, and not um, the prosecution. This absence of any testimony about a console table, this absence of anything about Ethel typing up the notes. But Justice Jackson, on June 12, got up a cert petition, a petition for certiorari, which is how a case is is heard before the Supreme Court, and a petition for a stay of execution. And he wanted the court to hear an oral argument about the case. And that was pretty significant. Um, justice Jackson was a, a pretty um, harsh justice when it came to habeas corpus. He didn't like to grant petitions of habeas corpus, but he thought that this argument about the knowing use of, of, of perjured testimony had some merit. The, the, um, the Rosenbergs argued in the brief to Justice Jackson that the pretrial story to authorities was a very different tale from the trial testimony of the Green Glasses, as different as Hamlet without Hamlet. Right? Well, I think this, this um, grand jury testimony in the absence of any typewritten notes and the absence of a consul table supports that argument. And I just wonder, as a matter of constitutional history, if the Supreme Court Justice of the United States in 1953 in June, had had this grand jury testimony in front of them, whether they would have granted certiorari, certiorari in the case and stayed their executions and then heard the case on the merits. Because any death penalty case today would have been heard, like this, would have been heard on the merits by the United States Supreme Court. And it was only because of the court's own internal dysfunction that, that, that you couldn't find four votes for certiorari um, among the justices. But, but I think this grand jury testimony, had it been available to them, um, would have tipped them over the edge and they would have granted cert, um, notwithstanding all their um, infighting. So those are so some of the things I think are interesting on a human level, on a legal level, and then as a matter of constitutional history that the um, Supreme Court really didn't hear the strongest argument in the case. Thanks very much, Brad. That's uh, really striking. And let me just ask David Vladek now, who's one of the, also one of the few human beings who's read through all of the Rosenberg materials, transcripts, trial, and uh, has been fighting this case now since 2007-2008. Yeah, um, well first of all, let me start by making some thank yous. Uh, first of all, thank you Tom, and thanks the National Security Archive for all its support in this endeavor, and particularly in setting up this press conference. I also want to thank my co-counsel, Deborah Raskin of the New York law firm, Flonic uh, Raskin and Clark, for all of the work that she's done. The, the reason why we brought this case in 2008, and the reason why we've been trying to unseal other historically valuable grand jury records, is because as this case shows, 
grand jury records often shine a light on historically important matters that is unavailable in any other place. And the grand jury records here add an enormous amount of information to what up until now has been publicly known about the Rosenberg case. Uh, the revelations in 2008 led to the confession of Morty Sobel, one of the co-defendants of the Rosenbergs who had been convicted, sentenced to jail, served an extensive jail sentence, and always denied that he was a Soviet spy. The day before the last round of release, Morty confessed, essentially, that he was, in fact, a Soviet spy and tried to justify his actions uh, on the record at that point. Today, I think we have further confirmation that there is at least a likelihood, if not a certainty, that Justice Department lawyers either knowingly support perjury or at least presented testimony that they had reason to doubt was accurate that led to the conviction and ultimate execution of Ethel Rosenberg. And let me explain why I can make that kind of claim. So if you go look at the historical record, there was no evidence that existed at the time she was arrested that Ethel Rosenberg had participated in this conspiracy. She was arrested after her second appearance before the grand jury, where she refused to answer based on her Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination to answer a number of questions from the grand jury. But at that time, given what the grand jury knew and what had been in the then extant FBI files, there is nothing that placed Ethel within the ambit of the conspiracy. Then you have the, the uh, we now have access to all of the grand jury records. And so the question then, is there anything in the grand jury records that suggests Ethel was an active participant in the conspiracy? And the answer, again, is no. Yes, there are two episodes, both in Ruth Greenglass's and David Greenglass's testimony, that put Ethel at least in a place where she could have gained evidence about the conspiracy. One. There's, a, there's an important um, episode where uh, there's a meeting at the Rosenberg household where a, a, a signal is created out of a jello box to allow David Rosen, uh, to allow David Greenglass to understand and verify the bona fides of a Soviet agent. Ethel is present in that conversation. She witnesses this, but she was not, but, 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 but that's about it. The second, there is a conversation between Ruth Greenglass and Jules, uh, Julius Rosenberg at the house of Julius Rosenberg discussing enlisting David as a, uh, as a Soviet spy. Again, she's present in the household. Is it clear she's a participant in this conversation? No. It is highly unlikely that those pieces of evidence would have been sufficient to put her in the conspiracy. In order to be part of conspiracy, one needs to take an overt act of participation. So David Greenglass's grand jury testimony is exactly what he told um, Sam uh, Roberts it was 15 years ago when, when David Greenglass was interviewed by Sam Roberts. He took the position then, and it seems to be confirmed by his grand jury testimony, which we have received today, that he fabricated evidence, not because he wanted to, but because he was pressured by prosecutors that put his sister at the center of the conspiracy. How? Because the allegation came to be that she typed his notes that were then passed to Soviet couriers. Now, a couple of things about that. There's no evidence that there was a typewriter in the Rosenberg household. Ruth Greenglass was a typist. And 
In hindsight, David Greenglass said, and this is not an exact quote, but it's darn close. I don't remember Ruth doing, uh, Ethel doing any typing, and in fact, if anyone did typing, it was probably Ruth, my wife. So you have David Greenglass, after the fact, claiming that he manufactured testimony to satisfy the Department of Justice in order to make sure they had a case against Ethel Rosenberg. Why would the Justice Department do this? They always expected Julius to confess. If you look at the Justice Department memos, the expectation was always that Julius would not risk a death sentence for his wife. And at some point, he would confess just as, as every single prior Soviet spy the Justice Department had called. And so ultimately, of course, Deputy Attorney General McGrath pointed out that no one expected the Rosenbergs to call the Department of Justice's bluff, but they did. There are a couple of other troubling signs. One is, and this comes from an FBI memo, the FBI put together Harry Gold, the Soviet courier who was responsible for taking these secrets and, and, and getting them to the Soviets, and David Greenglass together so they could, quote, mesh their testimonies, quote, neatly and convincingly to avoid creating doubt in the jurors' minds. Now, this is a clear prosecutorial abuse. You don't put testifying witnesses together and allow them to mesh the Justice Department's words, not mine, their stories in advance to trial. This happened just three months before the trial. The revelation that struck David and Ruth Greenglass about the typing took place just 10 days before the trial in this case. The trial in this case took place in March uh, 1951. And finally, the last piece of evidence that I find deeply disturbing is the Justice Department always expected to avoid that the Rosenbergs, to avoid execution, would confess. And there was a memo outlining the questions to be asked of the Rosenbergs were they to make such a confession. Question five was, quote, this was for Julius, quote, was your wife cognizant of your activities, close quote. An odd question if, in fact, the Justice Department had evidence that she was, in fact, a participant in this conspiracy. So I think that the, the, the grand jury testimony that's been released today provides further indication that putting aside questions about sort of moral guilt or innocence, what did, what did Ethel know and when did she know it, the Justice Department did not believe it could get a conviction, or at least a conviction that it would be satisfied uh, with based on the testimony and the evidence that it had at hand. And it is deeply troubling to see these grand jury, uh, uh, these grand jury minutes that suggest that the government uh, actually either deliberately put on testimony it knew to be false, or at least put on testimony it had reason to doubt its accuracy in a capital case like this. Um, let me make one last point, which is uh, the fact that this was a capital case, um, I think Steve's point at the beginning uh, makes this an enduring case. Uh, Ethel Rosenberg was the first woman electrocuted by the government. She was only, as, as far as I can tell, only the second woman executed by the government. The first, Mary Surratt, of course, was executed by military tribunal uh, for her role in the Lincoln assassination. Uh, but one of the things that's galvanized the public just obsession about this case is the execution of a mother with two young children. 
and uh, it is deeply, uh, it is of deep concern that this execution may have been based on evidence that certainly has questionable uh, provenance. Um, I think I'll just end there, and we can take some questions. Maybe I'll, I just want to say, say a couple things. I disagree a little bit. I think it was one thing that you said, which is that I think that the evidence does show that Ethel took an active part in this conversation with Ruth in convincing her to, to try to convince David um, to spy for the, for the Russians. I think it was, wasn't just passive. It, it, there's, from the grand jury testimony, from Ruth's testimony, and also from the, the account of it that Julius gave to the Soviets that we have from the Soviet archives, it seems pretty clear that she did. Whether that's enough to right. have convicted her or not, I, I don't have an opinion sure. about it. Um, but I, I, this is a minor point. And I think that, um, to me, that there's two really important distinctions, that, and, and we've made them clear today. One is, what do we know in the totality of evidence that we know about today, um, about um, whether they were guilty or not, and what they did, and what was provable at the time? And, and there are different issues, and everything that, that um, um, uh, David and Brad have said about their concerns about the trial don't change the fact that the Rosenberg ring w was one of the most um, effective um, espionage rings that operated against the United States pro probably ever. And, um, and that's really important. One of the things that's, that's kind of underlined in this testimony uh, that demonstrates how important the Rosenberg ring was and how much the Soviets trusted Julius Rosenberg was the fact that um, he had been briefed during the war about the details of the atomic bomb and he used that information to be able to recruit agents who were in the right places and to be able to brief David Greenglass as to what information he should be able to get. And if you think about it, that, that um, indicates an extraordinary degree of, of trust and, and their sense of how valuable Julius Rosenberg well, let me so maybe, maybe I would just I would just say that I'm I'm not in any position to um, judge if this, this is one of the most um, dangerous firings in U.S. history. I'll, I, you're probably right on that. I have to defer to your expertise on it. But this was a really sad episode um, for the U.S. criminal justice system. Um, this is not a good precedent um, for the Justice Department on how they prosecute the case and the United States. Um, the federal judge who tried the case. Um, or uh, the United States Supreme Court um, on their conduct of the case. Um, so if this country um, associates its, its criminal justice system um, with due process, um, there seem to be a real absence um, of due process. And fortunately, um, we have some safeguards in place um, about grand jury testimony now um, that would prevent um, this thing from happening again um, that happened in the Rosenberg case that um, as culpable as they may have been. And I don't think David and I would ever, either of us, um, would dispute um, their involvement with the, so with the Soviets. But I think from a legal perspective, um, this just makes me um, really sad that we um, put two people to death um, with this type um, of due process or lack thereof. I, you know, Steve, I don't disagree with you. Uh, I do think that it's important to draw a line between what we know as historians and what the government could have proven at trial. And, and my concern really just goes to the latter point. I don't have any, and, and I think, you know, one of the interesting things that we talked about this earlier about David Greenglass's grand jury testimony is how sophisticated Julius Rosenberg's knowledge of the atomic uh, bomb, the ongoing efforts at Los Alamos, uh, just the sort of the engineering behind the bomb was. I mean, and the fact that the Soviets both knew a lot about it and were willing to entrust that information to Julius. Uh, I agree. To find, out more. Um, to find out more certainly underscores everything that you said. The question, the separate question is, did the government have enough to charge uh, to charge Ethel Rosenberg with a capital offense and to convict her on that basis. That to me is her medically sealed off question about the justice system in the United States. Yeah, that, and that's why I started off by saying that I think that, as you, know, as you said, the, 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 the reason that everybody is fascinated by this case is because of the executions, and, and I would just take it off the table as an issue to the extent that, that I don't know of anybody who, who thinks that that was just or, 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 or if I could just summarize, 
the, the Cold War narrative of the Rosenberg case was a split between leftist supporters who said they've been framed and rightists and centrists and law enforcement who said they're guilty of espionage. And the fascinating thing about these documents is that both are true. Both are true. They were framed. There was prosecutorial misconduct seeming clearly, particularly in Ethel's case. But there was also a very sophisticated espionage ring, both industrially and for Adam Secrets, that Julius was at the center of. So you change a black and white Cold War narrative, framed or traitors, into a very nuanced gray area. Well, both. And the other thing you get by reading these, these um, uh, grand jury testimony also is that as close as anyone's ever going to get to being in the room, you feel when you read them, you, you feel like you're in the room with them. There's a drama to it, and there's also an understanding that these were um, young people who were caught up in something that um, was far more serious and complicated, I think, than they, even in their, their kind of grandiose dreams, um, had, had imagined. And I would just point folks in the actual green glass uh, transcript, grand jury testimony, the key passages we were talking about just before this event are on page 12 and on page 30, where Greenglass is specifically asked at the bottom of uh, midway through page 12 about did Ethel ever make reference to any citations or commendations, meaning from the Soviets? And Greenglass answers, my sister has never spoken to me about this subject. You can read that as being maybe just about the commendations, but then later the prosecutors come back and on page 30 they ask again, in effect, um, about uh, about his sister, and he said there they ask, uh, did Ethel also try to persuade you to stay in the army, meaning meaning to continue spying? And Greenglass answers, I said before and say it again. Honestly, this is a fact. I never spoke to my sister about this at all. Seven months later, he testified at trial that his sister was at the core of the conspiracy. Let me just, questions, Ed? I had a very specific uh, technical question. You mentioned the Jell-O box. Right. I, I want to make sure that I read this correctly. So you you read this to believe that she was in the room and present and aware? She was in the kitchen cooking while the, I mean, there were, you know, so there, the other people in the room literally took a Jell-O box, cut part of it in half. Ruth, uh, Ruth and David Greenblatt were to keep one half, and the Soviet courier who would show up in Albuquerque, New Mexico, or Los Alamos, to collect David's uh, findings, David's drawings of, of uh, various components of the bomb and so forth, would prove their bona fides by showing the other half of the jello box. And, and you know what, one thing that's interesting about... And, and, and Ethel was present during... That but the farthest you can take that is that she could have been in a position to have known. Well, she knew. She, 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 she knew. knew. She knew what the, what was going on. But, yes. But the the other thing that's really interesting about that that we I think that I don't know if we knew this before was that when um, Harry Gold knocked on the door and had the Jello box, it was it was, it, it was in Bruce. It was in Bruce's purse. It was in Bruce's purse, which, right. which shows how how much she was in, in, involved in in all of this and how. David knew that actually she, she was at tremendous risk because she really that she really did do she really was integral to to, to the thing. By the way, that's I, on page twenty five. By the way, the transcript. Oh, oh, Where did you get the other part from? I took it out from my wife's wallet. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the other thing that, that that isn't in here, but what is, is really interesting, it's a background that you have to know about David. Also, is that he's desperately also trying to hide the fact that he was. Um, far more involved in, in, in espionage for longer than what he had told the FBI. For example, as late as January of 1950, he had been um, conspir conspiring with Julius Rosenberg to try to spy on um, the place where he was working. He was working at, a, at a, the Arma um, factory in New York that was making tank stabilization um, hardware. And, and he um, told Julius, well, let's, let's get this for the Russians. And he'd asked Julius to give him a camera and said he would smuggle a camera in and take pictures of it. The Russians said, no, that's too dangerous. Just draw it from memory. This is in January 1950. He, 
he didn't tell the FBI that, and, and he certainly didn't tell the grand jury about it, but he, he knew that, um, you know, he was in this a lot even more de deeper than um, he'd let, let on. It's a great point. It's also not what he told Sam Roberts either, right? He implied to Sam Roberts that if it were between um, my wife or my um, sister, I'm going to side with my wife, but um, he wasn't just protecting his wife. Um, he was protecting himself as well and his own deep culpability, not just on what he did during the war, but, but after the war. So um, there was some self-preservation um, going on um, as well, and not just the, the preservation of his wife. Right. Any other questions? Yes. So in regard to the conduct of the Justice Department, either they believe that Ethel was guilty of conspiracy, but they didn't have sufficient evidence to convict her without uh, supporting perjury, or um, they were so vindictive toward the Roosevelt's they didn't care either this, way. Let me just repeat the question was, that it was, what, was it that the Justice Department uh, one or the other of those two things, right? Yeah, David, I, you know? I, yeah, David. No, no, no. I, I think David was right on this. I think the Justice Department is using Ethel as leverage. I think Herbert Brownell um, has, the, the Attorney General um, conceded this, um, that the Justice Department was using Ethel as leverage to try to get Julius to confess. So in order to use Ethel as leverage, they have to be able to charge her as part of the conspiracy, except they didn't have any evidence of overt acts. That, that would um, allow them, at least in the record, to charge them with conspiracy. And I think they realized that um, leading up to the trial, that they didn't have enough evidence against Ethel. And, and, and then we get different testimony um, from um, David and Ruth Greenglass, different than their grand jury testimony. So um, I, I don't think there was any vindictiveness um, up on the part of the Justice Department. Um, it, it was, there was a strategy, right? We're, we're going to get him to confess and to tell us what he knows and what he's done. And the way we're going to do it is to endanger the life of the wife of his two young, of, of Julius Rosenberg's two young children because you know, they'll never go to the electric chair. Um, they'd much rather confess um, than have um, both of them go to the electric chair. Right, and his line was, we never expected them to call our bluff. That was his line, not mine. Brown, his being Brown, Herbert Brown, 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 the, the Attorney General's. Well, let me make one other point. It's not clear necessarily that the Justice Department lawyers orchestrated this, this last minute shift in testimony by Ruth and David. What is clear is they should have been suspicious as hell at this fortuitous last minute complete change in their testimony. This is so fortuitous to them, so out of keeping with everything else, the green glasses have told the FBI for months and have told prosecutors for months that they should have been deeply skeptical of the testimony. Yet they went ahead and used it. So there are really only two, there are really only two choices here. Either, as David Greenglass has alleged, they pressured the Greenglasses into changing their testimony. That's Greenglass's story. Roy Cohn, one of the prosecutors, pressured them into putting Ethel at the center of the testimony. Or they knowingly use testimony at trial that they should have been deeply suspicious of. Um, and neither of those, neither of those options um, sheds much good light on the Justice Department. And there's a case called uh, uh, the Mooney case. Um, would have been it would have been constitutional error um, for the prosecution to do the latter, which is knowingly the knowing use of perjured testimony would have been reversible error and would have resulted in a new trial um, for the Rosenbergs um, if that had come before the United States Supreme Court and if the Supreme Court, I think, had known what we know today. All right. Thank you very much. Do you have one more question? Yeah. yeah. And I, I may have to come back to you for a bit more simplification of, uh, of all of this. I'm with the French News Agency, AFP. It's Robert McPherson. Um, the, the I'm just trying to think how I'm going to put this. Okay, I'll put my second question in while I try to remember the first one. Why is it that America still hangs on to this institution of grand juries? I mean, no other major legal jurisdiction or most minor ones don't have one anymore. When it's duh, <laughs> and yet they hang on to it. Well, I mean, my, my first, first of all, I'll just, I'm not a criminal lawyer, 
So, uh, but but I no, but you are a citizen. I'm just a law professor and a grand constitutional lawyer. I mean, grand juries are in the United States Constitution, right? Um, this was seen to be um, something that was empowering to the people to have control over who does or does not get prosecuted, right? Remember, the people are voting whether to indict someone or not. Well, the founders um, never envisioned um, that that um, grand juries would um, indict a ham sandwich. Um, in the words of a former um, New York Court of Appeals um, judge, they, they, they saw these grand juries as a, as a check. check on prosecutorial overreach and not something that prosecutors would use um, to manipulate the system. So we have it, I think, because it's in our Constitution. And our Constitution, I know from teaching constitutional law, is really, really, really hard to change. And, right. and these documents today do represent a kind of check yeah. on prosecutorial power just 60 years too late for the Rosenberg. The other thing is that you see in, in some of the testimony, uh, not the, so much the ones today, but from the last round, that the uh, the grand jury w wasn't passive. Oh, they, this grand jury was, was they, they quite were asking questions. They were asking questions. They were they were very actively involved in um, in trying to get to the bottom of what what was happening, um, which is a, again getting back to the human drama. But it's it's a fascinating thing. Let me answer the question in a different way, which is. Grand juries is compared to what? I mean, there are instances in the United States where felonies can be instituted on, on the basis of information, that is, indictments that are not handed down by grand juries. And I actually think that as weak a protection as grand juries have become, it's still better than the alternative. And you say the rest of the world has abandoned it. Well, most of them don't have the same kind of criminal justice system. Yeah, they have much more of a magisterial system where the prosecutor and the judge are one and the same in some sense, at least at, at, at the investigative stage. And so I, I think there, there's a lot of history, of course, and constitutional pedigree um, that speaks in favor of retention of grand juries. But um, I think that sometimes they serve a fairly beneficial function. One of the early grand jury unsealing cases I did um, had to do with race riots in Columbia, Tennessee. This was a post-war race riot, one of the worst in the United States. It was instituted by the state police. There was a federal grand jury constituted largely because Eleanor Roosevelt, Roosevelt insisted on it. Now, the grand jury ended up not indicting anyone, but the grand jury report is, uh, is, is just an incredible document. And uh, but for a grand jury system, there wouldn't have been any entity to engage in this kind of, of really meticulous investigation of what took place. And, and, and just to sort of go back to David's litigation in this case, we wouldn't know what the prosecution did <laughs> without this grand jury testimony, right? We, we would have some FBI documents, but, but this is the best record we have of what the prosecution knew when it was seeking an indictment. Okay, going to, going to the question I was going to have before I had my memory lapse there. But what can you do with this now, practically? I mean, it's not going to do Ethel Rosenberg much help now, obviously, but um, what can you do with this information going forward? There's a wonderful quotation from Martin Luther King, Jr., where he says, the arc of the moral universe is long but it bends toward justice. And I think what this case is all about is bending that arc, correcting the history, hearing the warning about prosecutorial misconduct and unchecked government power, and alerting ourselves against a black and white view of history. In the front of Steve Usden's book, he, he talks about their, you know, both concepts <laughs> Uh, of can, can active Soviet spy ring and it, yeah, basically it, the idea that you, it's not that hard now to have two ideas in your head at the same time, which is what I wrote there is, is that McCarthy was wrong about almost all of the specifics of what he said, and the Soviets still had and the Soviets still had very very active um, espionage operations in the United States, and and so what's the point of it? The point of it is, um, you know, what can you do with this going forward? I mean, you know, change the way history is written. Can change, yeah. You can change the way that people think about it, and and people um, in history is a lot. People cite 
and, and use um, history to justify things that happen today and that they do today and um, put it in a totally different context. For, for example, in the Ukraine today, there's a very you know passionate disputes about the history of what happened there during the Second World War, which is really integral to um, both sides' perception of what's happening there today. Similarly with the Cold War, with espionage, and, and it doesn't take a great deal of imagination to think about um, what people's um, thoughts about prosecutorial misconduct and, um, and, the part, and the actions of the Department of Justice might mean um, today also. See, I think this is much bigger than a Cold War story. It's about how we prosecute politically unpopular members of our society, um, whether they're detainees or terrorist suspects, and about not taking um, procedural shortcuts um, when we prosecute those types of people and to protect, to give um, defendants their constitutional rights. Uh, they, defendants can still be tried um, under our system without sort of cutting corners um, in terms of um, prosecutorial misconduct and other sort of abridgment of rights. So I think that's the lesson. I think this is a negative lesson, a reminder of the Justice Department um, to do things the right way. All right. Thank you all very much for coming today. And uh, enjoy your uh, reading of the Green Glass Thank you. Thank you. Please, copies, yeah.